This is Kyle Lelson from Feast, Wednesday, July the 1st. John Keats and Charles Brown didn't walk from England to Scotland but took a coach on July the 1st, 1818. Keats didn't much like the borderland. It was too much like a no man's land, like a frontier. Two dreams of landscape haunted him. The warm and cultivated south and the savage, romantic north. The borders, flat moors and bog land lit by a thousand little streams like snakes left in cold. As he said, I know not how it is, the clouds, the sky, the houses, all seem so anti-Grecian and anti-Charlemagne-ish. <laughs> we all think that, do we? We all wake up thinking, this is just not Greece, is it? <laughs> this is Greece. It was raining too when they travelled up to Dupreece, as it was when I crossed in a little Scott Rail train nosing through Gretton and Annan. Keats and Brown's first stop and one of the imagined highlights of his tour was Dumfries. After an abortive visit to Wordsworth House, they hoped that a visit to the grave of arch-radical Burns would restore some faith in both poetry and politics. When he saw Burns' mausoleum, he didn't like it. He felt it was it did not pay proper uh, respect to what Burns actually was and instead was a sort of kind of caricature of what people thought Burns, the romantic notion, the ploughman poet and all the rest of it. You know, the legend was already being created around Burns, uh, you know, months after his, after his death. I wrote this wee poem called The Poem Past Carlyle. I like writing about trains. I, I, I wrote to Scott Rail and asked to be writer in residence for Scott Rail. <laughs> and, uh, no, well, to, to give them credit, they did ask me to send some poems, and I did. But I realised that most of them were completely critical. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose you wouldn't want that. This one called Poem Past Carlisle. The world through old muslin filaments sliding everywhere in washed out light. The tracks flung across land like choked veins, past industrial follies, beaten fields, lost battlefields. It would take a Greek sun to fire the history of here into something worth imagining. Taliesin, Merlin, Longshanks, the wet road, the doomed legions marching to the end of the world. Not today, a forbidden can of Guinness, half a dozen bored cows, a kid chasing a helium balloon screaming the length of the train. So when they arrive in the face of bad fellows, they say, they arrive in Bad Fettel, uh, he writes a strange sonnet about Burns' tomb in which he invokes Dante's circle of, circles of hell, right? obviously to an extreme reaction to, to Burns' tomb. The only book they took with him was a miniature version of, of Dante's uh, Inferno. Uh, anyone who has travelled, this is from the book again, uh, although Brown mentions how <coughs> much the road was were potholed, <laughs> when, uh, when, the, when, the coach, changed, then. when the coach comes along. So they had a very uncomfortable coach ride uh, into the dour mm -hmm. streets of Dumfries and its dour barefooted people. Uh, Brown calls them more serious and solidly inanimated than necessary. Anyone who has travelled the endless pothole bus routes into the town would sympathise with Brown's view. I'm sure it was a 246 or maybe a 212 <laughs> that detached my retina a few years back. A stagecoach took my sight. Keats felt the town and its institutions should have been kinder to the poet when he was alive rather than making a hypocritical fuss when he was dead. It was a theme he returned to later when he tried to give the old curator of Burns House in Alloway a good kick in. Keats and Brown also arrived in Scotland not long after a biographical sketch by James Curry pioneered the ranting Robin interpretation of the poet's character rather than the radical soul that appealed to Keats. So already, you know, that whole idea that Burns the womanizer, uh, Burns the lover sort of thing is, is, is you know, taking the place of Burns the radical, Burns the, you know, uh, the political idealist and so on. So much easier, isn't it, for people 
to think of Burns in that way rather than think about his actual ideals, his actual principles, and perhaps act on them. It's, it's kind of sanitation of Burns, isn't it? He says, as is Keats, poor unfortunate fellow, his disposition was southern. How sad it is when a luxurious imagination is obliged in self-defence to deaden its delicacy and vulgarity and write in things attainable that it may not have the leisure to go mad after things which are not. <coughs> so he's kind of suggesting that, that Burns has been forced to sort of do things and act in a way in which uh, uh, you know, his, his soul uh, would otherwise have uh, you know, gone differently. <coughs> Basically he's given poets an excuse for bad behaviour in, uh, in that description he read out, but you know, what choice do people have in the Presbyterian streets of South West Scotland but to drink too much and <laughs> debauch? <laughs> he goes to St Michael's Church. He doesn't particularly like, as I say, Burns' mausoleum. And uh, I wrote this wee poem about St Michael's as well. I mean, at St Michael's Church, it's full of uh, gravestones with Burns' friends. You know, there's the cult of Burns and the cult of Burns' Burns's pals. These, these photographs, by the way, are all from an absolutely brilliant book uh, by Carol Walker uh, called uh, In the Steps of uh, in the Keats' Northern Journey. And uh, she takes a lot of photographs as she goes along. I think she does it more seriously than I did. So this is called St Michael's. Water blackened stones, stains like ink spots seeping through, bursting in moss like pus. Time has rid us of names apart from the carefully chiselled. The friends of Robert Burns, Dr Carmichael, Mrs Chisholm, etc., the Burns Society remembers them in little blue discs. One served Burns beer, talked behind his back. Another lent him five pounds, dined out in it after his death. He wasn't inclined to pay it after. <laughs> Ministers still glower at their stone flock, at the pauper's grave where they flung Burns, weighed down at last by small-time misery and spite. But a country to be born and die in and be resurrected, of course, when they made commercial sense. <laughs> he goes to Lincoln Abbey. He's in a melancholic mood, and it gets worse. He goes to Lincoln Abbey, where uh, he likes the ruins. Burns, of course, wrote about uh, Lincoln Abbey, uh, wrote movingly about Lincoln Abbey, and uh, he walks then from, or the pair of them walk from Lincoln Abbey to uh, Dalbite, where they took some whiskey. Uh, Keats, having started off thinking whiskey was the annihilator of poetry, warmed to it <laughs> as, uh, as time went on. And to, so I wrote this wee bit about uh, Dalbita Year, including Abbey. This is July the 2nd, 1818, Thursday. Like Keats and Brown, I visited Lincoln College, a fabulous medieval building early in the morning. The Abbey is now closed to an estate and the teens have adopted it as their base for extramural drinking and shenanigans. I'm pretty sure if Keats, still in a southern mood about the natives, would not have appreciated this development. As Brown said, wretched cottages where smoke has no outlet but by the door. Having appreciated the sunlight and the ruins, they marched off to Dalbiti, a mere 15 miles. I took the bus, though I think we followed much the same route. While I was using the Peace and Galway Council's online travel timetables, <laughs> they were probably using the Traveller's Guide Through Scotland and its Island 6th edition, 1814, 7th edition, 1818, in which they would have found details of points of interest, mountain, roads, accommodation hints and maps. Fifteen miles was moderate walking for them. They often get up at 4am and could cover up to 30 or 35 miles a day. What Keats is uh, not a travel writer, of course. Uh, the travel writers often uh, uh, brought, uh, shone a spotlight on, on landscape and so on. Keats makes political points uh, during his time in South West Scotland, particularly not, not political in, in terms of Scotland and England, really, but definitely against the Presbyterian Church. And uh, he blames the Presbyterian Church, really, for its, for its treatment of Burns and for generally uh, making Scotland such a dear place. And you've got to give them that one, I think. <laughs> <laughs>